when you look at enslavement, you have to look at post-enslavement and the black people who might have immigrated from here or there or someplace else, those folks also experience the enslavement consequences of structural racism. So, you know, my maternal grandfather, as an example, is, is Haitian. Um, uh, my, fa my dad's folks are basic black folks. Um, and m most of my mom's folks are basic black folks, but the, my grandfather was Haitian. And um, what does that mean? Yeah. He experienced discrimination. He worked on the docks uh, in um, New Orleans, and he experienced discrimination. Um, he experienced stru structural discrimination, and many others did. The problem, my problem with Eidos is that they're violent. They threaten people. They threaten lives. They keep up a lot of mess. They shout people down at meetings. Um, the California Commission for Reparations has uh, released their report, 1,100 pages worth of report, a uh, very comprehensive report. But some of the sisters who are on the commission, one in particular, a friend, um, was called so vilely out of her name. Uh, mm. At one point, called a bed witch. Mm. A bed witch. Mm. This is one black person calling another person a bed witch. Mm. Um, see, that's why I don't have weapons. <laughs> <laughs> it's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. Beloved, my name is Rock Newman, and this is the Rock Newman Show 2.0. Thank you so very much for tuning in and being a part of today's broadcast. It is, it is, my guest today is someone I've been waiting to get back to the table for such a long time. I'm going to tell you, you're going to see me do something unorthodox, might even be, um, unprofessional in terms of the production of a uh, of the show that we do but just give me just one minute you'll understand today is the birthday of Dr. Julianne Malvo. And anybody that would take the time to come in to do the show with me today on their birthday, we had to do something to honor them. And Dr. Malvo, you deserve these flowers and many, many more for a lifetime of support, love, and upliftment of our community. Thank you so much for all you do. Happy birthday. I ain't gonna sing because you run me out of here. You run me I all guess the way I would. Yes, I would, Rock Newman. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Thank you. And gosh, and my favorite color roses. And oh my goodness. You know, I knew orange, I knew orange was you had a proclivity towards orange. And if I if I understand it right, you, you're a Delta girl, right? Uh, yes, I guess I. And this is the white, so okay. the red of the of the red and white. So thank you for joining us. Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Do y'all know this woman right here? We're gonna try to make sure that you get to know a little snippet of her. There are, I'm telling you, I've got notes all over my pages. How many different places where I can start? But what I what I want to do is you wrote a book a while ago, which there's a new uh, release of it, and it is Surviving by Dr. Julianne Malvo, Surviving and Thriving, 365 Facts in Black Economic History. You dedicate this book 
to, to several folks, but I want to ask you about something. You said you dedicate this book especially to my aunt, Annie Mae Randall. When you make that dedication, it makes me think that your Aunt Annie Mae Randall some kind of way lives through you. Tell us about Aunt Annie Mae. Auntie Annie Mae was a trip. And I have some of her in, her in me and some not in me because she was a Mississippi woman. She died in 2000 at the age of 101. Mm -hmm. um, after I got put out of high schools in San Francisco, they sent me to L.A. and then I got caught up in... Uh, Karinga's group, and that wasn't going to happen, so they sent me to Mississippi, um, which was an interesting experience. That's high, so I was in the 11th grade, the high schools, or the 10th grade, actually. I don't know, 10th, 11th. The high schools were segregated. Uh, so I went to the black high school, Magnolia. Auntie Anna Mae had been a teacher in Moss Point, Mississippi, for more than 50 years. Mm -hmm. She taught everybody the fifth grade. Everybody. So I couldn't get away with anything. I tried to, you Miss Randall's niece? The next thing you know, there will be a phone call. I had picked up the habit of uh, cutting school because mm -hmm. I was ahead of the game. Um, so I occasionally chose not to go to school. Instead, went to this club called the Kickoff Club, which was owned by some former <laughs> NFL player. So, so I, some folks call that skipping school, but go ahead. <laughs> and um, well, I chose not to go to school. And um, I would sit on a bar stool and have my little ginger ale. I was 15, 16, you know, couldn't drink. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I wanted to, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I'd sit there and have my little ginger ale and flirt with the bartender. Okay. I'm sitting there one day. And, and Auntie Anime was about, maybe she was five feet tall. Okay. And she was a rotund lady. Uh-huh. Short and fat. Uh-huh. And would karate chop anybody. Uh -huh. Kid, people knew her about her karate chops. Okay. She karate okay. chop children in school. Okay. But that was 1969. You could get away with that. Sure. Um, but in any case, uh, I feel somebody at the back of my neck pulling me and saying, little heifer. Little what heifer. are you doing? All right. Sitting here. Were you supposed to be in school? Smack, 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 smack. And then made me walk home. It was about a mile and a half. And while she sat in her big old Cadillac, cursing me out all the way. My Lord. <laughs> all the way. Uh, now me, that's a scene in the movie right there. <laughs> called me all kinds of names I couldn't even. I'm like, what is that? Called me a strumpet. I had to go home and look it up in the dictionary. Strumpet. <laughs> a strumpet. Yeah. But uh, she, I mean... She was a registrar of voters. She bucked the system on one hand, but on the other hand, she had a long streak of time in her, too. But that came from being in Mississippi. And what I'm learning through my work, Rock, is the way that basically deference was beat into us. Lynching was about deference. You will obey the rules. You will not color outside the law lines. So I remember going to the bank one day with Auntie, and um, she... She told me, oh, this is Mr. Dantzler. They used to own us. Mm. So I said, so where are my MF reparations? Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't say MF. Yeah. Next thing you know, smack. You don't disrespect white people mm. like that. Mm. I'm like, huh? And all the way home, she told me how good the dancers have been to us and blah, 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 blah. And we finally got home. I said, I, I said to you, no, you ain't nothing but Uncle Tom. Smack. See, those folks yeah. back in the day, they, they did believe yeah. in hands-on discipline. Um, but it didn't do anything to me. Okay, <laughs> so why did you write this book? It's a love note to my people. It is called, again, Dr. Malbo, Julian Malbo, Surviving and Thriving, 365 Facts in Black Economic History, which, which is... Absolutely profound, and you should get it. You should get it and make sure that your children know about this book. Give them this book. Teach them this book. But why did you write it? As I said, it's a love note to my people. Yeah. The facts that we don't know about. People always put us outside the economic periphery, and we need to be central to it. Uh, I'm working on a book now called uh, Lynching the Wealth Gap and Reparations. You know, I, 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 I know about that, and I was absolutely got my note here that said, 
your new, new book. I didn't know whether you were talking about it yet or not, but I was going to try to get you to I'm talk about it. About but it. let's finish this one but, and, then, and then talk about your new one. But, but the, the, the lynching piece, a lot of people think that lynching was about black men raping white women. But a lot of lynching was economic. And what this book is about, the economic good news, as well as some of the bad news, but also just we need to center ourselves in the economy. I'm an economist. I'm an accidental economist. I intended to be a lawyer when mm -hmm. I was a kid because mm -hmm. I like to talk. Mm -hmm. I like to argue. Mm -hmm. That's what lawyers do. <laughs> you know, I like to read. But um, somehow you had to take a social science at Boston College, and I took economics, and I fell in love with it. But the accident, because economics is a study of who gets what, when, where, and how. Yes. And yes. Just as politics is, so the politically, yeah. but who gets what, when, where, and how? And so what we have here are stories of people who got what, when, where, and how. Of Sadie Alexander, the first black woman to get a Ph.D. in economics, and someone I consider a role model. Dr. Phyllis Ann Wallace, who was a mentor to me, first black woman to get a doctorate from Yale University. Um, there's so many others. I mean, we have so many of our people who basically have worked on our economic survival and thriving. And you know, some of our millionaires, Bob Johnson, you know, we, the Bob Johnson story is an amazing story, but it starts with Marion Barry giving him a c cable franchise. And Marion Barry actually ought to be in the book because frankly, he created so much wealth for black people yes. here in the District of Columbia, and he doesn't get credit for that. People want to go to the little salacious headlines sure. and talk about the ugly sure. stuff. Sure. Well, as we've been talking about before we were set up, ain't nobody perfect. Yeah. There, there is no perfection. But Betty Shabazz used to say is find the good and claim it. Mm -hmm. And what we, have, what we have to say with all of our leaders, many of them are flawed, find the good and claim it. Yeah. And that with Mary and Barry, what we must claim, and what Bob Johnson must claim, is the foundation of his billions is Marion Barry. Absolutely. Um, at a time when Marion, I've always maintained that for uh, several years of his, uh, uh, his leadership uh, here in Washington, D.C. as mayor, he perhaps was as good, if not the greatest mayor ever, for what he did during that time, you had Maynard Jackson also. The two of them, yeah, you know, oh God, was, the two of them were bookends. When you, when you look at the two of them, I mean, uh, Maynard Jackson used to say, "Subcontract or no contract." Yeah, that was his line. Yeah, which meant you want to do business with the city of Atlanta. Yes, you had to find some black people yeah. to do some business with you. Yeah, and Marion was the same way. He didn't quite say it that way, but he was the same way in empowering so many black leaders, mm -hmm. so many black people to become wealthy. Also, just the um, depositing and industrial bank is in here. The deposits into industrial bank sure. from city agencies <clears throat> was very important. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, Doyle uh, Mitchell and I were leadership Washington classmates, and he talked about, I uh, interviewed him extensively uh, for something I was writing about banking, and he said it's, the deposits are great, but it's also the investment that's needed. Yes. And uh, because the deposits, deposits come, deposits go, but the investment mm -hmm. means that you basically are investing in a slice of that bank. Yeah. And, it's, and what black banks, you know, once upon a time, Rock, we had over 100 black-owned banks. Now we have 23. You know, that's a statistic that causes me to think about doing a radio show 40, 40 years ago, 1980, and I had a gentleman on. I was talking to him. He was holed up, barricaded in a property. I think it was in Arkansas because he wasn't let allowing the authorities to take his land. Mm. And so when I hear there were 100 <coughs> banks and now there are 23 and understand the history of how the land grabs have taken place, that land has just been taken from yes. our community. There's just such a common thread that goes through to something else we were saying before the show. There are a few people in here. Is It is a wonder that black folks in America 
who are unfairly portrayed as more violent. <laughs> that the black folks aren't, don't commit more homicides with the pervasive racism that exists that reaches down into our community 24 seven, harassing, intimidating, oppressing, denigrating, and disrespecting. Oh yeah. Uh, 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 James Baldwin, you know, to be Negro and the relatively conscious. It, it, it really, this, you know, the reason why you had the post reconstruction laws, the Jim Crow laws, the black co codes, is because white people were afraid that we would do to them what they had done to us. When you look at the, the details of enslavement, of the things that occurred to our people, of the rapes of our women. You don't get black people to like, look like you and me yeah. without white folks having been doing some stuff they had no business doing. Yeah. But, and, but we often forget our men were also raped. Yeah. They were also rape men, a um, bunch of freaks. Um, and, and literally, your body was, you had no agency over Correct. your body. Correct. Not only raping women and men, but also often forcing family members to watch. Imagine what that then did to those family relations. If I imagine that, I might, I might be charged with homicide. But no. Well, we're, we're, well, let's... you know, I mean, that's why I don't keep weapons. You know, I mean, Nina Simone. I don't keep weapons because I might use them, and I have often had plenty of provocation to use them. I live next door to some colonizing people who do not seem to respect the fact that I own my property. Yeah. Um, now, I haven't had any incidents with them lately because they know better. Mm -hmm. But we have had incidents mm -hmm. where they mm -hmm. will simply, their workers on my property come into my yard, never saying, may we or can we just, you know. The, and like I said, had I a weapon, yeah. there will be some dead people on Corcoran Street. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention the people with their dogs. I mean, th why is it difficult for you to understand that your dog is supposed to be on a leash. Right. There's a leash law in yeah. D.C. Right. But these people who think their dogs are their friends, um, well, that man told me the other day, not the other day, about a year ago, but the dog doesn't like the leash. Uh -huh. I'm like, so you need to move to like the country or something. Yeah. Because in the District of Columbia, there is a leash law. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, but anyway, I mean, it, it's interesting, the caucasity of folk, that they, they, they simmer in their caucasity, and they believe that they have literally the right to um, be, be in charge through a racial hierarchy. But the challenging thing with my Auntie Anime, to get back to her, is that because she was 101 when she died in 2000, she had lived through the 20th century, sure. and she sure. had lived through I mean, the one, in, in the dedication, I talk about our property line. In Moss Point, Mississippi, the fence moved one day. Literally, we owned some property, um, and it led to a bayou, which was fish rich. And we apparently were very generous, so this is all oral history, and let anybody come down there and fish. But a lot of people didn't like the fact that we owned their property. So one night, the fence moved, moved. And it took us, my family, not me, but years, decades, to establish that that was our property. And the compromise with the city was that there's a place in Moss Point called Hawkins Lane, because we're Hawkins, so it's called Hawkins Lane. So basically, we gave the property to the, the city. Now, we didn't choose to give it to them, yeah. and uh, Auntie would always say we had a couple of cousins who went missing. Now, you know, when people went missing, sure. you, you know, that sure. they might have gone north and whatever, but more than likely, what happened was they yeah. were killed or lynched or something. Yeah, yeah. Folks, um, we try to keep it real here. We, we um, are committed to speaking truth to power, and what you're just, what you just heard in part is someone with a very vivid understanding relationship 
to the kind of atrocities that have happened in her lifetime and connected to a family. You just hear that they went missing. They went missing. And Julianne, you said something earlier about Aunt Annie Mae is that she had been really submitted into deference. Mm -hmm. Although she was a fiery little woman, mm -hmm. she had been submitted into deference. And it feels somewhat humiliating and embarrassing to me that I would reveal that my father once argued with me that black, the black man couldn't be as good as the white man. My father did that. Mm. My, 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 my dad, dad did that. He was born in 1906. Well, see, that, they, they were socialized to that. They have got that message five and six different kind of ways, five or six different sources, and not five or six. Everything in the structure basically taught them that. I'll tell you another story, which um, causes me great, um, I don't want to say pain, but it, it angered me so. So I took my mother to Biloxi. She went to this uh, school, our Mother of Sorrows uh, school, which was uh, administered by uh, an a, a order of nuns that were supposed to teach the Indian and the Negro. Mm -hmm. So she had never flown first class because she basically didn't like to fly. Um, I had all these points, so I said, we go on first class. We get on the plane, there's some white people in our seats. I said, uh, excuse me, these are seats. The woman uh, waved her hand and said, we all can sit over there. Now we had like A and C, yeah. and they had whatever, F yeah. and yeah. whatever. Sure. And she said, y'all can sit over there. But when she did that, yeah. you know, that triggered me. Yeah. I said, oh, hell no. Holy said, These are our seats. Yeah. And she said, well, you can sit there. I said, I went and got the uh, flight attendant, and the flight attendant was a sister, and she said, uh, told him they had to move. Yeah. And the woman argued, she said, well, what's the big deal? I said, the big deal is 2A is my favorite seat, yeah. which it is, yeah. still is. Yeah. Um, I said, and furthermore, these are our seats, and we are entitled to them. And she mumbled a bunch of stuff under her breath, and meanwhile, my mother starts crying. She says, Julianne, we could sit over there. Yeah. And I'm like, no, ma'am, we cannot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and she yeah. said, she said, well, it's not. It, we Generation said, sensibility. I Let's mean, make said, sure we go along to get along. So she said, we still, we have the window in the aisle. It's not a big deal. I said, mother, we're sitting in our seats. Yeah. And that's how it is. Yeah. And she got so agitated with me that she fussed half the way from San Francisco to New Orleans. Then we get to New Orleans. And I'm not the best driver in the world, I would admit. <laughs> um, but the. And my sisters were like, do not get stopped for speeding. Mm -hmm. So I got cruise control, which I would never have gotten. They yeah. got, so I set it at 55, to 55, we get stopped. Mm. Man says, I'm going 57. Really? And um, he told me to get out the car. I said, no, that's not happening. And he said, why not? I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm not getting out the car. Proteon starts crying, Julian, you know, he's a policeman, he's got a gun. I'm like, mother. Let's not go back through what we just been through. Yeah. And but then when she started crying, then he's his humanity came out. He went to the other side of the car. He asked her why she was crying. She said, "Please don't lynch my daughter. She has a she." She said, "Please don't lynch my daughter. She has a flip mouth. Mm. Please forgive her." Mm. I said, "Mother, do not ask this man to please nothing." Yeah. And he he came back over. He says, "I'm going to give you a ticket." I said, "Fine." I said, if, if I was speeding, give me the ticket. That, I, but I'm not getting out the car. Yeah. And um, it, it, then she cussed me all the way to Biloxi about why, don't, why would I not be deferential to white people? I said, mother, because it ain't in my DNA. Yeah. It's, but she, again, a product of, yeah. you know, the South feeling. And, 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 and also, these were her cousins who went missing. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and you know what? So I told that story about my, I told that story about my dad had no idea that would, you know, surface now. But when I think about my mother, see, I was the I was the I was an insane Muhammad Ali fan. And I would repeat the things that he said. Right. She, 
I didn't even understand it at the time, but she was definitely afraid. What she used to always say, Roderick, somebody's going to hurt you. If you keep running your mouth like that, somebody <laughs> is going to hurt you. <laughs> so I, now I, I, I reflect back and I feel the fear and therefore the trauma that she had from the trauma that someone born in 1907. Yes, exactly. Experienced. Well, exactly. And so the, 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 the fact that our community maintains its sanity and just doesn't go all out crazy is, a, is just a miracle in and of itself. But, you know, um, lynching was a form of social control. Oh, yeah. And when we did go crazy, and some of us did, the repercussions to the entire community were horrible. The lynching of Mary uh, Turner, uh, this is a horrible lynching story, but it begins with a white man named Hampton Smith. Mm -hmm. And the way that he maintained, he maintained his plantation in 1918, 19, I've got the year, uh, he maintained it by basically bailing brothers out of jail. Yeah. And then they would work for him for an indeterminate amount of time. Yeah. Indeterminate. They sure. would have said uh, sure. two weeks, three weeks. That's indeterminate. I'm going to ask you to hold a second. Folks, turn the, turn the sound up because I'm familiar with this story and I want you to be familiar with this story. Ooh, yeah, it is a story. So Hampton Smith uh, beat this man because he was sick. The brother got him a gun and killed Hampton Smith. Mm -hmm. And he also um, shot his wife. He winged her, so yeah. her shoulder. Um, hmm. They lynched 13 people in 14 days. Uh, anybody who had any connection to this brother, they were a church member, they were a friend, they lynched him. So they lynched, the last one they lynched, um, and I've, Turner. Uh, the last one they lynched was Turner. Mm -hmm. And basically, his, wa his wife went down to right. the courthouse and fussed. She was 19 years old yeah. and nine months pregnant. I was going to say pregnant. And yeah. she fussed and said, someone is going to have to account for this. Yes. So they lynched her. They took her and hung her by her ankles. They doused her petticoats with oil. They lit her on fire. And then when um, the baby expelled, they stomped the baby. Um, so women were also lynched. She was lynched for being mouthy. Yeah. She was mouthy. Yeah. And, you know, when I, I, when I tell sister friends about, we talk about it, I'm like, shit, we all would have been lynched. Excuse my language. Yeah. We all would have been lynched for being mouthy because yeah. we mouthy black women. And look, <laughs> about that mouth, I, I, I want to get this point in right now. So you were a frequent commentator on television, CNN. I think you were on Fox a few times. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you did MSA, NBC. I did, I, I did them all. Yeah, okay. And I used to see you debating some of the guys or as a guest, challenging some of the traditional thought. And I would say... Boy, I wonder if she can survive on television, on, on, on network television, cable television, speaking that kind of truth. And a few years later, you weren't there anymore. <laughs> Tell me about that experience, please. Well, you know, I, 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 I do good TV. I enjoy doing TV. Uh, but I was actually told, you know, you need to calm it down. You need to, I think I said something about Trent Lott. I said, uh, show me your sheets. Yeah. And that one got me in a, a fair amount of trouble. Um, and I think the producers decided that I was a little too controversial and the calls stopped coming. And, yeah. um, you know, I was doing uh, to the contrary. Those who have that power, those who have that power, yeah. do what they can so that voices like Julianne Malveaux, which is something that our community needs and really is something society needs if we're ever of the mindset of making America a more perfect union, they shut it down. Absolutely. It, 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 and, it, you know, obviously it, it was both financially painful and uh, personally painful because I was good at what I did. 
But the flip side of that is that you, um, you pay a price for telling the truth. You pay a price for, you know, I, my reputation, unfortunately, is that I'm difficult. I'm not difficult. I just say what I think. Yeah. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be candy coating the truth. And that's why, you know, that's why we have so much drama around the so-called culture wars. We're really talking about truth telling. I had a really um, fascinating experience. Uh, I'm the president of Push Excel which is the uh, education arm of Rainbow Push. I'm blessed to have a sister who's on the Illinois uh, Board of Education, uh, appointed by the governor, Dr. Donna Leak, and she, her, she has a colleague, Dr. Sonia Whitaker, and the two of them have brought us all kinds of information from that granular situation. Well, they did, they actually allowed us to listen to some high school students talk about diversity. And a young white girl said, I'd rather learn about black history than to learn algebra. And what she said is black history, this is a young girl, she was 17 maybe. Mm -hmm. Black history is American history, and I don't know why it's not being taught. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's what we should go forward with. Why is it not being taught? What are you afraid of? Well, they're afraid that black people are as crazy as white people are. Afraid that we will do to them what they did to us. But we, no, if, if we had done that, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. Yeah. You know, so we have basically taken it. Um, and just recently, I mean, there have always been the, our rebels. We've always had our Frederick Douglasses and, you know, our, our Richard Allen. Doesn't and, compare to the diabolical treatment no. that we've received in this country and I want that allows me to to transition to a subject that I wanted you to speak on um, I live now in Florida mm -hmm. which has led the <laughs> charge of book banning yes talk about it well, first of all, Ron DeSantis is crazy, and he's using the so-called culture wars to uh, place himself in a space of competition with the orange man. So basically, he wants to be more extreme than he. Even the orange man never said, let's ban books. Now, he did say, let's ban diversity training in federal governments, but he never said, let's ban books. Um, but DeSantis has really um, used this as his cudgel to elbow his way into presidential politics. Yeah. And even in doing that, he's not getting any juice. You can see his, he's, his poll numbers, Nikki Haley is now upholding him. Yeah. Um, before it's over with, so will Tim Scott and a whole bunch of others. But in any case, what is happening in Florida is an attempt to uh, whitewash history. Which is expanding across the country. 44 states have introduced legislation to um, outlaw teaching about race. They, each of them uses different language, but it's not supposed to make anybody feel inferior. It's not supposed to make anybody feel uncomfortable. Well, hell, the American Revolution was uncomfortable. The definition, <laughs> of, the, the, the definition of that is don't tell the truth. Exactly. So 44 states has passed in about 20. I'm not sure of the exact numbers. Uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, Air, Air, uh, Arkansas, first thing she did, mm -hmm. first thing she mm -hmm. did, as if they, Arkansas, mm -hmm. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, poorest states in the country. Mm -hmm. First thing she did was outlawed critical race theory. She doesn't even know what critical race theory is. But you're sitting at the bottom of the income distribution, yeah. and that's the most important thing you think you can yeah. do. Yeah. You can't try to do something to wage, raise wages or do something to change working conditions. No, you, you go right there. And unfortunately, these white people, and I said white people, and I mean it, are like Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Ron DeSantis, what they're doing is they're gaining um, approval for white people who don't know anything. So they say, oh, yeah, we don't want to know about black history, and we don't want to know about this. Critical and so they feel race that, theory. And critical race they theory have no is, a, idea. is a legal concept that will not, I mean, if you get it in high school, you might get it in the 12th grade in a social justice class. Uh, if you get it in college, you, it's a legal concept. 
uh, that Kimberly Crenshaw and uh, Derek Bell and some other legal scholars, basically, and the theory is that, and it, it's, it's perfectly correct, everything is designed to hold up a racist structure. So it's structural racism so that it's not a person. You know, you have, like I have ignorant next door neighbors that they're racist, but they're racist because the structure allows them to be racist. Mm -hmm. They're not racist because they don't like Julianne Malvo. They're racist because they live in a structure mm -hmm. that supports their racism. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, so we have to be clear because we don't want individual white people to say, oh, gee, they don't like me because I might be racist. But to say to individual white people, look at the structure yeah. that you came up in and what can you do to dismantle that structure. Mm -hmm. Because that's what needs to happen mm -hmm. is that white people, conscious white people, and there are many, conscious white people need to be dismant about dismantling structure. And I don't think that many of them are. I think that they benefit and they will tell you, you know, like with reparations, they'll say, oh, but I never had any slaves. But you benefited from a structure that allowed enslavement. And then post-enslavement, because we just, people want to stop at slavery. Don't stop at slavery. Look at post-reconstruction, yeah, yeah. when laws were passed mm -hmm. to prevent us from fully participating in society and in the economy. Yeah. And you, you benefited from that. So you can mumble if you want to, but you benefited from that. You mentioned the name Tim Scott. Mm -hmm. Black dude, I ain't gonna say brother, black dude, black guy mm -hmm. from South Carolina. He don't wanna hear that stuff you no, talking he right now. No, he's Mr. Happy. If I got a dollar for every time he said Jesus in his opening speech, Rock, you and I could go to the Four Seasons and have two <laughs> bottles of wine at least <laughs> on top of some lobster. Uh, I mean, he truly, He's Mr. Happy, and it, his, all he is campaign his personal story, if I could make it, so can you. If I could make it, there's no racism. That's baloney. Yeah. So we're talking about this. We're talking about race. We're talking about something that is pervasive, always has been. And, you know, the older I, I, I saw, I saw what I thought was a trail towards greater equality happening that it had some momentum and i think that's been stopped and it's turned it's, yeah. it's, it's turned around mm -hmm. now this have this show happens to be taped on your birthday and it's the weekend of the congressional black caucus so all of this that we're talking about the sort of the hurt the pain the suffering Talk to me about what you think the Congressional Black Caucus is doing. What kind of impact, positive impact they're having, and what more should be done? Well, there's plenty more that should be done. But the Congressional Black Caucus uh, is the uh, annual legislative weekend where each member of Congress has the ability to put on a workshop of what they're working on. Um, Maxine Waters has one today on youth empowerment, as an example. <coughs> and she's always been really focused on younger people. Um, I'll participate in something later today. Sheila Jackson Lee does a reparations uh, workshop. And as you know, I'm a member of NARC, the National African American Reparations Commission. Um, but there are many, many other workshops going on. And, they're learning opportunities. And people always at conference say, okay, so af after we went to this conference, what happens next? And people always say that what happens next is up to you. You know, the, the, the conference does not give you, people say, we need a black agenda. Well, we have a black agenda. We need to close the wealth gap. We need to close the unemployment rate gap. We need to close the education gap. We have an agenda. So I hear a lot of negative talk about Congressional Black Caucus, and I really just am repelled by that talk. Now, a lot of people say it's nothing but a party, and I will confess, did I go to four parties last night? <laughs> I believe I did. Uh, but they were not really parties. They were networking opportunities. Mm -hmm. I saw people I hadn't seen in a while. But the, the, I think the workshops are as important as the networking opportunities, which sometimes are parties and sometimes aren't. Um, so I think that we, we've got a good um, cadre. I think we now have 55 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. 
We have people from unlikely places like the chair, Stephen Horsford, who's from Nevada. Las, Las Vegas, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, so we've got people who, you know, usually we expect our members of Congress are coming from predominantly black areas, but yeah. we have them coming from all over. Mm -hmm. We've got some notables who've been there forever, like uh, Jim Clyburn, 80-something, um, and there's a discussion going on about how long should people stay in. But as long, I, my answer is as long as they're effective. Mm -hmm. And when they're not effective, then move on. And I think Mitt Romney, um, not the, to give that Republican props, but he's a decent Republican, and he said he's not running for re-election. Mm -hmm. Time for a younger generation to come in. So I appreciated that. I think a lot of people appreciated that because it sets a, a tone for others. But it's, I, I, I find the Congressional Black Caucus annual legislative conference, and let's call it annual legislative conference, I find it to be uh, stimulating and important, and I try to attend whenever I can. Okay, okay. Now, I have, I know, and unquestionably, it's, it, it shows up in the comments, and in many other ways, uh, my uh, viewership um, is heavily what we would call conscious. Mm -hmm. the conscious, they woke. Or woke. <laughs> conscious, conscious community. Kind of, and I think, I think the folks that I'm talking about are really beyond woke. Um, they want to see a radical transformation of the society that we live in, and this is the point I'm getting ready to make. Uh, I want you to talk about is too many. I think mm -hmm. are in. There ain't no need for me to vote. Oh please, uh, vote. Mm -hmm. They are, too many, I think, are in that boat. And to them, you say what? If you don't play, you can't win. I mean, I understand that a lot of people are very frustrated uh, about the political system, but staying home simply empowers the oppressor. If you choose not to vote, you're saying you don't care what happens to you. You don't care whether your street sign gets changed. I mean, a lot of women uh, got propelled into politics behind educational politics. And a lot of them got involved when they wanted a street sign uh, because cars were zipping by and kids were endangered. Uh, and they started there and they went on. Um, so I, if, if you don't care about the terms and conditions of your existence, then don't vote. And then don't complain later. Because that's the other thing. And then compl now, the, nothing is perfect, and the system is not perfect. And I'd be the first to say the system is extraordinarily flawed. However, with those flaws, we've had victories. Uh, Barack Obama became president because we voted. Now, what we got out of it is another story, but he did become. You wrote a book on that, right? I did. Yeah. Are, we, are we better off? Yeah. Race Obama and public policy. And I conclude that we weren't better off. But symbolically, in some ways, we were. Mm -hmm. um, and what Maxine Waters told me one time was really interesting regarding the Congressional Black Caucus, but other organizations. She said, people talk about what we don't do. They never know what we prevented from happening. Mm -hmm. All these legislative conversations are happening behind closed doors. And so you never know what they took out of a piece of legislation. You know, what they decided, you can't put that in there because it's racist. Uh, so, you know, the fact that we have a Congressional Black Caucus is important. And the fact that they are effective is important. Now, some of them, you know, the, the, about, they're the cadre of them that tend to be more centrist than progressive. Mm -hmm. But they're still people who care. Now, the radical transformation, I, I, I get you know, I get what your folks are saying about a radical transformation. I do think it's important to have that in our mindset. But I don't think that that means, that doesn't happen, revolution doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. You know, and I mean, imagine that there was a revolution. Um, we already saw them people try a revolution on January 6th of 2021. The structures, unless the revolution removes structures, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Let's say that, you, you know, we, black folks, decided we're going to take over Capitol Hill. We're going to bust in and do all that. The Army's not going <laughs> to, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, he's not going to help us. He's going to say, if you black people don't sit yourselves down, all y'all going to jail. 
And believe me, it would not take as long as it's taken for the Proud Boys. Oh, we'd, we'd have know. been dead. Yeah. We'd have been shot and killed. Mm hmm That would be If black folks had, had, had performed the kind of behavior that white folks performed January the 6th, there would have, there would have been slaughter. Oh, yeah. There, oh. there would have been slaughter. And to, to those of you who are that conscious, and I understand your call for upheaval. I understand your call for revolution. I understand you're saying even that the political system is a bird the, and the Republican has, is one wing and the Democrats are the left wing of the same bird. You're talking about what Julianne is talking about is about the system. Um, certainly from this chair and from my life, I've n never been one to move forth in fear. But the question, I think, becomes, what is in your best interest that you can control today? Had that kind of talk not permeated our community, we would not have had Donald Trump <laughs> as the president. So that talk, y'all was talking, it helped to get Donald T Trump Hello. elected. How did that work out? I'll tell so you. So you, I think you gotta, as opposed to just being emotional. And look, right on, right on. You know, black power, revolution, all of that. What's happening when you don't vote next week, next month, in the next four years? How does that work out for you? So I would say, analyze much deeper. Go below or above your emotion mm -hmm. and, 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 and make a decision. That's what I'm, that, that I'll, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing a guest, but I, I just had well, to Well, I'm glad you said that, though, Rock. There. I'll tell you, I had a young lady. She was a Bennett Bell. Uh, I had arranged for a bunch of uh, Bennett uh, students. And when she says Bennett Bell, you know, again, modesty, she was the president of Bennett University. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I had arranged for some young sisters to be part of the 2016 um, Democratic National Convention. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, of course, the convention was, um, well, it was a convention. Was a, but anyway, these little sisters were telling me they, could, they couldn't vote for Hillary because they didn't like her. I'm like, Hillary ain't coming to your house for tea. So whether you like her or not is not the issue. Fast forward a couple years, we had the orange man as a president, and he had appointed Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. One of these little girls who I had told him, I said, I, I, am, I'm, I can't deal with y'all. But anyway, she called me and she said, Doc, what are we going to do about our abortion rights? I said, let me help you out with something. I said, I'm over 60. I don't have abortion rights. Yeah. I said, this is irrelevant it to me. Doesn't, I said, it doesn't it's, impact you. I said, but if it was relevant to you, your behind should have voted for Hillary. Mm -hmm. And then she said, well, I, I said, see, you, you cut, you know, you cooked your own goose. You know, and, and, and then when they got, got Kavanaugh, she called me back. She said, oh, what are we going to do? I said, what you mean, we black girl? You know, I vote every election. Yeah. You know. So I... You mentioned reparations earlier. In this particular folks, uh, book, folks, I'm going I'm to I'm suggest to you all, get this book, Surviving and Thriving, 365 Facts in Black Economic History by Dr. Julianne Malvo. You dedicated, and one of the first names that you dedicated to outside of your family is John Conyers. Yes. And I think it's relatively fair to recognize John Conyers as sort of a leading guy, sort of who really initiated the talk about reparations. And, and, and you know, so what I would like to talk to you about is to ha have you address. Make the case for reparations, one, mm -hmm. and two, I've talked to, many folks have sat here and I've talked to other people and there is a 
absolute splinter ring of the drive and the fight for reparations and people who you mentioned ADOS mm -hmm. appear as if other people if other organizations everybody who's fighting for re reparations accuses the other folks who are fighting for res reparations as not doing it the right way and sort of We've become an enemy within, yes. which sickens me. I suggested at one point, one show I was doing, I suggested, look, how Quincy Jones got all of these artists in the studio to do We Are the World mm. and said, check your goddamn ego at the door, that perhaps the drive for reparations should be Let's all get in the room. Can't nobody have a cell phone. Can't nobody have a camera. Where well, you're trying to show time. But get in and get in and have the nitty gritty work of challenging and debating each other and try to come out with a unified front for something that's so real, so valuable, and so much of what we deserve. The internal fighting only it seems to me to dramatically prolong the results that we want. So, Well, I'm, for, first of all, John Conyers was a forerunner, of course, of legislative reparations. The talk for reparations goes all the way back to the 18th century when enslaved people, there was a sister who basically sued her white folks for a pension mm -hmm. and won. Mm -hmm. And so we, we can go through, look at Queen Mother Moore, look throughout history, there have been talk of reparations. The 40 acres and a mule was supposed to be. And of course, reparations were given to slave owners. <laughs> yes, exactly. White folks got paid. Uh, just like Haiti had to pay France yeah. reparations. But in any case, H.R. 40 was first introduced in 1989 mm -hmm. by Congressman Conyers, and he introduced it every legislative session since until his death, and then Sheila Jackson Lee has taken up the mantle. What H.R. 40 initially called for was a study, a study on what reparations would be. Now, now that the legislation has been updated, it's not just a study, but it's also a remedy. It asks that a commission be appointed, that it do what you know government commissions do, run around the country talking to people, and that a remedy for what was taken from us be suggested. So it's just not a study bill, it's also a remedy bill. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think the most promising thing we had over, or nearly 200 co-sponsors of H.R. 40 in the last legislative session, uh, before of course the Republicans got the Congress. So now we're asking President Biden to create, he can make H.R. 40 law through executive order. And so we're asking him to do that uh, Dr. Ron Daniels has been the leader of NARC, a National African American Reparations Commission. Robin Ruth Simmons is a young sister who, um, from Evanston, Illinois, who basically did the legislation for the first actual uh, reparations, and they've done they've used their weed money to provide uh, some reparations for some families. It's not comprehensive enough. The issue, of course, with all this infighting is that no one thinks that the solution is correct. Um, the Eidos people believe that you must prove that you are a descendant of enslaved people in order to get reparations. Um, I don't believe that because I think that when you look at enslavement, you have to look at post-enslavement and the black people who might have immigrated from here or there or someplace else, those folks also experience the enslavement consequences of structural racism. So, you know, my maternal grandfather, as an example, is, is Haitian. Um, uh, my, fa my dad's folks are basic black folks. Um, and m most of my mom's folks are basic black folks, but the, my grandfather was Haitian. And um, what does that mean? Yeah. He experienced discrimination. He worked on the docks uh, in um, New Orleans, and he experienced discrimination. Um, he experienced stru structural discrimination, and many others did. The problem, my problem with Eidos is that they're violent. They threaten people, they threaten lives, they keep up a lot of mess, they shout people down at meetings. 
um, the California Commission for Reparations has uh, released their report, 1,100 pages worth of report, a uh, very comprehensive report. But some of the sisters who were on the commission, one in particular, a friend, um, was called so vilely out of her name. Mm. Uh, at one point called a bed witch. Mm. A bed witch. Mm. This is one black person calling another person a bed witch. Mm. Um, see, that's why I don't have weapons. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, it would be good if people could come together, but there has to be some agreement on civility. Yeah. And Eidos does not agree on civility. You've got a new book coming out. Yeah, well, I'm working on it. Oh, you're working on it. Tell us, can we, can we get a glimpse here on the Rock Newman Show 2.0? Sure. Uh, the working title is Lynching, the Wealth Gap, and Reparations. Mm. My assertion is that... Let me repeat that. W lynching, the Wealth Gap, and, and rep Reparations. Woo. Yeah, so my contention is that black people's ability to accumulate uh, basically was stifled by lynching lynching laws, mm. all the deference we've talked about that's been built into our people. So if we, so that's how we end up with the wealth gap. In, 19, in 1880, Rock, we had $1 for every $36 white people had. Yeah. By 1910, that went down to $1 for every $16 white people had. In yeah. other words, we cut the wealth gap in half yeah. in 30 years. Uh -huh. Then, today, we have $1 for every $10 white people have. Okay. So we made less relative progress between 1910 and now than we did between 1880 and 1910. Mm -hmm. Why is that? All these laws were passed to prevent us from accumulating. We didn't get like the GI Bill. We didn't get the benefit of the GI Bill. Um, many brothers wanted to use the GI Bill to go to college, but they couldn't. Fewer than 1,000 people, I've got to find the number, in Mississippi, brothers were able to use the GI Bill. Brothers and sisters, because there were women who were veterans also. Uh, they told people, they said they wanted to college, well, you could go to barber school. Um, so basically tamping down, again, our ability. And so that, the tamping down of our ability to accumulate is the case for reparations. Gotcha. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming to the Rock Newman Show. Absolutely. In your comments, wish this good and wonderful sister <laughs> uh, happy birthday. Thanks for tuning in, Dr. Malvo. Thanks for joining us. God bless you, and we'll see you the next time. That's a wrap.